Um, right, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about some work that I've been doing over the past year, year and a half. And so on the Kakya set conjecture for general M. So maybe let me first tell you what a Kakya set is. Uh, so we'll be working on using a Z model for an uh, arbitrary N and the dimension of the space will be little N. And a Kakya set in the space will basically basically be any set which contains a line in every direction. All right, so this is our this is a Kakya set and what do we want to do with this? The problem we want to solve is uh, lower bounding, the sizes of these sets. And well, okay, it's a nice combinatorial problem, but why do we care about this? So, turns yeah, so, yeah, so the was never seen a Kakya set definition yeah. before. Yeah. So, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, right, so, okay, so basically a direction is- Can I say something? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Think about the plane, and you are trying to put a needle in. You are trying to put a, find a region in the plane so that the needle in every direction will fit. And you ask, what's the size of such a set in the plane? Instead of the plane, he's looking at uh, you know higher dimensional space, and instead of uh, you know uh, you know Cartier six zero, he's looking at you know finite field or finite ring. But what you want is that this your set, which is a subset, this is a cube, right? Z mod mz to the little m is just a grid, a finite grid, finite slope. But the, some of that's what I remember, but now he's asking that there will be a full line. Yeah, a full line. You always, and a needle is a full needle. It's always right. a full yeah, line. It's, not a, it's a full line. You always ask for a full line. You want a line in every direction, and you ask for the smallest set that contains a line in every direction. That's a general problem in any space. It could be defined in many such powers. Yeah, so um, as Avi mentioned, the, well, the actual first conjecture is uh, uh, about um, line segments in every direction in uh, Euclidean space. And this problem for, well, uh, finite um, abelian groups or for finite fields was first proposed by um, Wolf in 99 as a simpler version of this problem. So we haven't been able to solve the problem in the Euclidean case. So the hope is that maybe this problem is easier and uh, in, over other links. And if we can do that, maybe we'll get new ideas. So over the Euclidean uh, space, uh, you don't want to figure out simply the size. You want to say something about the Minkowski uh, dimension there. All right, uh, so another reason this problem comes up is uh, some connection it has to constructing randomness mergers and extractors. So if you're aware of this, these things, that's fine, but we'll be directly focusing simply on this problem, but it has connections in both directions. So there is some uh, problem in analysis it has connected to, and there's also uh, problems in TCS that has connections to. All right, so uh, um, this problem is completely solved over finite fields. So, Let's look at that result. So when n is uh, go? I'm sorry. First time. There, I guess there should be a condition such that sometimes just one line is the whole set, right? It depends on. Uh, it could be that you will to exactly cover everything with. So it turns out the sets are like large, so that cannot happen. Like you can't have a line in every direction just by having a single line. Every line has at most n points. There's no end. Ah, okay, hold on. Wait, every line has its most end. Sure, it doesn't fold. Okay. Yeah. No, it doesn't, it, <laughs> hey, it's not like a torus with an irrational direction. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. I mean, yeah. it does fold, but does fold, there but is stupid uh, risk. Okay, yeah. get it. It's only little end points. Yeah. Yeah, big end point. I'm, I'm thinking of the continuous where it can, yeah, never mind. But yeah, for, even for rational directions, that folding yeah. does not happen. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, the problem is completely um, solved or finite field. So, in particular, when n is prime, uh, we know that uh, Kakya sets at least have size little p uh, raised to n by 2 raised to n minus 1. So, uh, it's worth stressing. If you think of P dot, P dot, and then you know, for some any end you make P dot, it occupies essentially the whole space up to a constant. It depends on the dynamic. 
This is sharp. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this bound is sharp. Like, I mean, there are like some lower order terms which we don't completely know, but uh, the highest order term is uh, uh, sharp. So the this result, or like a uh, result of this form was first proven by um, Zev um, in 09, and there have been a series of improvements. So uh, we knew two days to end in like 2013, but to get rid of this extra factor of two to get the tight bound, uh, that was due to Book and Chow uh, recently, like a few months ago. Okay, uh, so now what about composite end? So until recent work, for composite end, the best bound that we knew was basically of the order of uh, capital N raised to little n to 0.59, like it's some rational number. Um, and that basically comes out of some work. It's 0.59? I mean, it's some rational number square root of two minus something. So I'm not like- no, no, I'm just asking what's written there. Is this uh, it's a constant? It's a little over, it's a little it's over n over two. It's a little bigger than n over two. Little so n. It, 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 yeah. Constant times and yeah. just maybe, confused by the way. Maybe another remark. Maybe over the exit and another remark. Uh, just getting a low bound capital M, it's too bad, it's the same letter. <laughs> getting a bound capital M to the power little n over two is the trivial bound in any such situation. It just follows from the fact that through any two points, there can be only one line. So that was always trivial bound, and the whole thing is beating it. Okay, so here they are beating it by you know from point five to point six. So, so it again, I will slowly. What what's the what is the trivial bound to get? So the trivial bound is having a little n over two in the exponent. So roughly square the size of the space. Okay, and the reason is that to every point, two points, there is exactly one line. It's a simple yeah, argument, example. but so the whole thing is beating this factor of two, but actually, yeah, making it making it one in the exponent. You want to say it's almost the whole space. It's something like n to the little n over some constant or whatever. Yeah. So um, and beating this 0.5 bound is due to some uh, work in a little combinatorics, and it's related to the sum difference conjecture. It's also called the arithmetic Kakea conjecture. Now, the reason is uh, this problem is the, the sum difference conjecture is much harder because if you're able to solve the sum difference problem, then you'll actually resolve the Euclidean Kakea conjecture as well. So there's a known reduction from the Euclidean problem to the sum difference problem. And if you can solve this problem, you will have your Euclidean conjecture as well. That's yeah, I mean, I guess it gives some hope that maybe, yeah, you can do combinatorics to solve this. So it's definitely good. Now, okay, let's talk about what kind of bound then are we hoping for uh, a general then? Uh, so, okay, the conjecture is the following. Um, now, as Avi said, we actually want to hit capital N raised to little n. So we want to make that 0.59 uh, to a one. Uh, but it turns out that you can't exactly hope for a very simple bound like that. Uh, so what you say is that, uh, let's say uh, you're allowing for an epsilon loss here. So capital N is to little n minus epsilon. So for any fixed epsilon, you should be able to find a constant which does not depend on capital N such that uh, any Kakea set over Z mod capital N is at least of this size. Uh, now, if you remember for a prime field, we did not have to worry about this epsilon nonsense at all. So it turns out that there are examples which show that this is needed when you consider composite and uh, if you consider prime powers or even say product of multiple prime factors. So uh, yeah, any bound that you will have will have to somehow uh, be of this form. Okay, um, now why, uh, okay, so why did we want to like solve this problem for general n factors? So now it turns out this problem for prime power was uh, suggested by Ellenberg, Gobelin, and Tau in 2010. And the reason they suggested this was that, okay, um, that uh, unlike the prime fields, Z mod P to the K is supposed to have scales. So what do I mean by that? Um, now, if uh, you work over the ring of PRX, and uh, you try to formulate a similar uh, Kakea conjecture over the, uh, 
over the PRX, then there is a way of connecting this problem over mod P to the K to the Kakya conjecture over the PRX by discretizing uh, the PRX to the scale P raised to K. So it's fine if you don't really know about this, but another way to think of this is that in some very, uh, like in some very clear sense, P square can be thought of as smaller as P, but there is like no metric sense that you can impose on just the prime fields like that. So yeah, so that's basically the, this other line that by solving this uh, problem for prime powers, you will be able to solve uh, a Minkowski dimension style Kakea conjecture for not the Euclidean uh, ring, but for the ring of PRX. So uh, it's fine if you don't know about this, we'll just be working with this combinatorial description and uh, all the results we'll talk about will be of this form. So what is what is the exact Kakaya conjecture for the PRX? It's the uh, same thing. So if you take, um, okay. So if, if you uh, take line segments in every direction in the unit ball in the PRX, then it should have Minkowski dimension. Yeah. Oh, so you define Minkowski dimension. Yeah. yeah. So and it turns out that if you disc okay, if you discretize uh, the unit ball and you see what it means for the Minkowski dimension to be, and that basically means you should have a family of like these bounds. R. But this would be now. Don't understand if when you say we, if you solve it for a fix, how do you think about it? You fix p and you let k go to infinity. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. But that's but this will give you n to the minus epsilon. I mean, they just call it, they the K N for whatever K you chose, call it N. Right. No, that I understand. But then it will be N minus epsilon. Yeah, but I have the answer. Yeah, yeah so it's it's arbitrary. The contents of the mean course, I see. The yeah. little N has nothing to do with big N. No, no, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, the bounds that we look at will have a like constant depending on K. Yeah. So. It's probably worth mentioning that this is unknown even for little N equals three. The Kakea conjecture in general. Mm -hmm. It's not known for n equals three, not in the plane, not in the, you know, but not known in the PR. For n equals three, it's a little n. So you can think of little n as three if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, okay, so let's look at like the first this, uh, bound of this form that we are able to prove. Um, so uh, last year, um, Zev and I were able to uh, solve that conjecture for square free n. So let's say you have n with our different prime factors. Uh, then any Kakya set here will have size at least capital N raised to little n uh, divided by two raised to n times r. And r is the number of prime factors. Now this uh, is enough to give you bounds of this type. And basically all you need to figure out is uh, what to make of this two raised to little r. Now, two raised to little r is exactly the number of divisors of capital N, right? So there are like standard bounds in number theory about how this two, uh, number of divisors of a number behaves as n grows. And that's enough for you to get bounds of this type and uh, proving the conjecture for square free n. Okay, uh, another thing to notice is that uh, when n was prime, so there was only one factor, uh, bound had shown earlier had little n minus one, but there is no minus one over here. So it turns out, uh, okay, so the bound which gets you the minus one came after this paper, but it's possible to use ideas from that paper and this paper and improve this to two raised to little n minus one times r. So which would make this uh, tight. So this bound is not tight, it's only tight up to a factor of two raised to r. But if you use bound, like the ideas from the, uh, book chow paper, you can make this um, tight. And okay, so another thing is that this bound is basically just the bound for each prime factor multiplied with each other. And that is very nice because if you think about it, uh, take a Kakea set for each prime factor and just take their product. Now, if you apply the Chinese remainder theorem, you'll be able to see that uh, the new set that you get is a Kakea set uh, over this capital N, where the product of R prime factors. I'll talk about that again when we uh, look into the proof. So uh, that's why also the bound you expect is should be the, just the bound for each prime factor multiplied together. Okay. So, all right. In this paper, we also made some progress for the prime power case. 
So what we were able to do is that show that any Kakea set in this space should have a size uh, which is lower bounded by the rank of a very explicit FP matrix and this matrix will not depend on S. Uh, so if you one was clever enough or this matrix is simple enough, you could maybe calculate its rank and give you, and that will give you a lower bound. So what is this matrix? Um, okay, so this is a matrix um, whose rows and columns are indexed by elements in Z mod P to the K. And it's uh, UV8 entry is one precisely when the inner product of U and V is zero. Another way to think about this is that the UX row of this matrix is precisely the indicator vector of a hyperplane in the space with normal U, um, right? Uh, similarly, you can observe that the VX column of this matrix is again the indicator vector of a hyperplane with normal V. Now, we were not able to like uh, figure out the FP rank of this zero one matrix, uh, but about eight, nine months after uh, this paper, uh, Arsovsky was able to uh, do that. Okay. I mean, I don't understand the notation. What does it mean? It's just a gram matrix of all vectors in this space. What? A gram matrix, the inner product matrix of all vectors in this space. But what, what does it mean? I mean, double you eliminate equal to a function. So, uh, sorry, uh, in the number, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, this is just a singleton here, but uh, all you're saying is that when the inner product of UV is zero, uh, then this should be one. And when it's non zero, it should be zero. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. It's not the, okay. It's, I thought that it's the autistic function of this opposite. Yeah, okay. so uh, I mean, if you take the whole row, then it will be uh, the indicator function of the whole hyperplane with normal uh, u, and similarly for the column. Um, right. So it's just a, a simple zero-one matrix, and you need, just need to figure out its rank over the field FP. And you take FP, you mean not? It's really the rank modulo p, not. Over FP, not over Z mod P to the K Z. No, 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 over FP. Well, yeah, maybe it, is, it was possible to improve our argument to do that, but what we have in the paper is precisely FP. Um, Did you try to check it numerically, the rank? Like for, uh, it's hard. I mean, it becomes pretty big, but yeah, for yeah, some... but like just for, uh, I agree, it's hard, but you can. Try it for small and values. It's not so food, so how would you? Yeah. So there are people that that, that look at these matrices and then try a lot of things. And yeah. I mean, uh, I okay. So when K is one, the rank is exactly known, which we also see soon. Uh, so I, I had a feeling that okay, this need, needs to be high, and I checked it for some values, but checking it for two values is not enough to you know say that okay, it's scientifically now it's clear that. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, it's it's high, but anyway, uh, now we do know it's high. So um, so Arsovsky uh, was able to uh, solve our problem, and he was able to show that uh, any Kakea set at Z mod P to the K has size at least little p raised to K n by K n uh, raised to n. Okay. Um, now what he actually did was. Um, like even improve our argument further. So he was able to show that there is some matrix V, which we'll define uh, later, um, uh, such that any Kakea set here is, uh, has size lower bounded by the FP rank of this other matrix V. This will be a Vandermond matrix and I'll define this when we talk about the P to the K proof. And he was able to show that this thing has rank at least. P to the K and by K and raised to little n. So why did I say that, you know, uh, they, he actually also solves our problem. So it turns out you can show that uh, W is a submatrix of this V. So it's definitely an improvement. Like what he does, he is able to add more rows and columns to his matrix. And it also turns out that this uh, V is going to be a submatrix of W for just one dimension higher. So a rank lower bound for this matrix also gives you a rank lower bound for uh, w. 
So, all right. Um, now, this, uh, so this, also, uh, this means that the P to the K cases are, uh, but I think a uh, few months after this, uh, in a new version of the same paper, Asovsky gives bounds for M epsilon Kakeyev sets um, with a slightly uh, different argument. What is M epsilon Kakeyev? Yeah, uh, so, and, and, and then uh, for in a, in a M epsilon Kakeyev set, instead of having lines in every direction completely contained in your set, you only have lines in an epsilon fraction of directions, and they're not completely contained. They just have at least M points in common with your set. So, um, it's a much weaker property, and you want to ask the same question. Okay, do we have lower bonds which will not depend on n, n, m and epsilon? Uh, and like, what will they look like? So maybe it's worthwhile to say that at least of our finite fields, the original proof for full line yeah. and for all directions easily extends. Right. Uh, indeed. So as we said, uh, for finite fields, uh, Zev's proof easily extends to this case of m epsilon Kakea sets. Um, yeah, but for a P to the K, some work had to be um, done. Yeah, maybe even uh, this is a version that's useful in the applications to randomness extractors and right. and so on. Yeah, so it's it's exactly this version which is also useful in the DCS applications for mergers and extractors. And uh, turns out this is also the kind of bound which. Uh, will not only give you Minkowski dimension bounds, but also Hausdorff dimension bounds for PRX. All right. Um, uh, okay, I guess, uh, but the bound in this new paper, they are quantitatively weaker for the N1 case. So this is basically the regular Kokia set where uh, the line is completely contained in it and you have all lines. So uh, yeah, this new argument, even though it works over a general setting, the bounds it gets for our original setting is somehow uh, weaker. Okay, so uh, now I guess improving on the state of affairs. Um, uh, recently, uh, I improved these arguments to give much stronger bounds for Kaki assets over Z mod uh, P to the K. So what we are able to show is that any Kaki asset S at least has size P to the K N by this quantity, let's compare the two. So instead of having k times little n, you have two times k, if you just ignore this log thing. And if p is, okay, so if you look at this log factor now, uh, if p is bigger than n, then log n to the base p is going to be very small and negligible. And even if p is small, then uh, log n is definitely much smaller than uh, little n. But do we know if K needs to be there at all? Uh, could you say that again? But uh, it, uh, do we need a K, K dependency? K is in the denominator. Yeah, uh, yeah, that needs to be there. It's in the constant, and it depends on capital M. Mm -hmm. We don't want that, right? So, so uh, that's fine, because the dependency on K... Okay, so you don't want K here. If it was K times N, like in this uh, power, that would have been bad. But having K here is okay, because as uh, K grows, this grows smaller than P raised to K. So... I don't know if that's what you. It, it needs to be there, right? That it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm sorry. It's minus it's, it's, if, if you if you call whatever the denominator is, the, the constant. Mm -hmm. What you wanted is that this constant will depend only on little n and epsilon, not on the size of the, mm -hmm. or right. the size of the domain. Yeah, and it does. So uh, now, okay. Uh, so what we wanted to do was uh, give constant for every epsilon, oh, right? Oh, if you if you allow minus epsilon, then it's yeah, 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 fine, good. Okay. So um, now, okay, so uh, we get this improvement by extending the techniques of the original version of Arsovsky's, uh paper, and uh, okay, another thing to say is that you can improve this constant further if you just uh, let p uh, grow. And you will get bounds of the type p raised to k and by k plus one raised to little m. And uh, this is very nice because we know constructions of the sets or z mod p to the k, where the size is very close to this. So you get k by log k instead of just k. But this just shows that, okay, this is a significant improvement and close to being tight. I mean, I expect that maybe the construction can be improved to get here, but I mean, I, 
right now i don't know how to do that so let's just say maybe the bound can itself also be improved okay um so oh and another thing to mention is that this new paper also gives uh, quantitative quantitatively stronger bounds for n epsilon okay assets so uh, just this uh, the this this new argument is uh, extended to the setting as well and you get stronger bounds there as well all right uh, and the title says general and so finally uh, what we show is a bound for an arbitrary n so you take an arbitrary n with r prime factors they have some powers uh and you show their sizes at least capital n raised to little n with this constant here and this constant is simply just the constant for each prime factor multiplied together okay and this is enough to give us n epsilon style bounds and I, again the observation is that uh the product of ki is is bounded by the number of divisors of capital n so again just using um some number theory bounds about the number of divisors of capital n you can get n epsilon style bounds and as before if you let all these prime factors grow then you can improve the constant to uh, ki plus 1 raised to minus n so get rid of this 2 and this log thing all right so now i've told you all the results um that we know of in this space so let's uh, talk about some proofs now so for the rest of the talk i hope to give you like complete proofs for a number of bounds so the first thing we'll do is talk about zev's original uh, uh proof which involves the polynomial method over z mod p then we will uh reinterpret zev's proof to give a quote unquote new proof and the idea from these new proof is what will help us first resolve uh the problem for two different prime factors and then we shift gears near the end to talk about the prime power case so the proof for 3 and 4 you just need to combine the ideas from these two to give you bounds for general n and uh, yeah hopefully we will get to like start the proofs and for here yeah. okay so let's uh, look at the polynomial method proof uh, due to the first so the proof that i'll be giving here uh is not exactly the original proof but it's an improvement to to uh alon and tau so what we show here is uh any kakya set or in fp to the n has size at least p plus n minus 1 choose n okay so uh let's just jump right into the proof oh, maybe i should say that this quantity is just p raised to n by n factorial uh at least right so okay so let's suppose that our kakya set is smaller than this quantity all right now this quantity is precisely the number of monomials of degree at most p minus 1 in n variables maybe i should have said in n variables right so uh, now because the number of monomials of degree at most p minus 1 is bigger than the size of the set then there is a linear combination of these monomials which will vanish identically on my set s okay so there exists a non zero polynomial of degree at most p minus 1 which will vanish on us now uh, s is a kakya set that means it contains a line in every direction so in particular for a line in direction u it will contain a line uh, lu and f will vanish completely on it or vanish on all points on it okay now fx plus lambda u is uh, going to be a univariate polynomial in lambda of degree at most p minus 1 uh but it has p zeros because the line has p points so this means this polynomial is identically zero okay so uh hopefully like this makes sense okay so now what will we do if you just expand this out um and you look at the leading term so that will be lambda raised to d and the leading term will have coefficient f d u so d capital d is the degree of the set and uh, f capital d is precisely the degree d monomials contained in f and it's it's and if you just like do some algebra you, you can see that this coefficient is precisely the evaluation of this f d at u 
and you will get some lower degree terms. But we, uh, for now, we just care about this. But we just saw before that this polynomial is identically zero. So namely, this FD vanishes on you. Okay. Uh, but we can do this for every direction because there is a line in every direction. So this uh, thing vanishes identically on every point. Now, FD is a small degree polynomial. It's a homogeneous polynomial of degree at most P minus one and vanishes on the entirety of FP. So that's impossible. So we, we get a contradiction. Now, okay. So the lemma you will use to say this is impossible is the de Miller lipton short zippel lemma. But um, it's, it's not hard to like prove at least this thing yourself. So it's just a multivariate version of the fact that a low degree polynomial can vanish on just too many points uh, over a field. So this is a very nice argument. So why does this not work for composite numbers? Now that basically happens because if you just try to repeat this argument there, there are polynomials over composite numbers which will just vanish on the entirety of the space while having very low degree. Um, okay, so in particular, if you look at Z mod P square and you look at the polynomial X is to P minus X whole square, then this will vanish on the entirety of Z mod P square. And this only has degree 2P instead of P square or uh, like similar. And that's because uh, X is to P minus X is divisible by P by Fermat's little theorem. Similarly, uh, X is to P minus X times X is to Q minus X will vanish over the entirety of Z mod PQ. This is a degree P plus Q polynomial and not degree PQ, which you would like. So that's also a problem. So if you were to just naively adapt our earlier proof strategy, we will just get bounds with a single prime factor, so P raised to little n, and that's just the square root, uh, so capital N raised to 0.5 little n uh, style bound, which as Avi mentioned is already true. You, you can just use simple combinatorial arguments to get that. So, okay, so what, what do we do, do now? So um, to do some improvement, I first reinterpret this polynomial method proof. Uh, okay, so for the remainder of the stuff, whenever I talk about a cookie asset, just imagine that the set is just exactly the union of a line in each direction. So if there are extra points in my set, I just throw them off. And because I only care about lower bounds, it suffices to just care about sets like these. So that's all, okay? Now, okay, so uh, we'll work with this new object called the line matrix of a Kakea set. Uh, and the line matrix of a Kakea set will be a matrix uh, whose columns are labeled by points in the set and whose rows are also labeled by points in the set, but these points represent directions in my space. And the UX row of this matrix is going to exactly be the indicator vector of the line LU uh, contained in S uh, in direction U. So hey, this is going to be very important. So if like the definition is not clear, it's uh, So it's, it's different than the, def than the matrix you had before. So the matrix you had before was the indicator vector of each hyperplane with normal U. Now this matrix depends on S. So this is, so S has a line LU in each direction, right? And the UX row is the indicator vector of the line LU in direction U. So, yeah. But we, we, we basically show that this, the rank of this matrix is lower bounded by that matrix W. Uh, okay, so, okay, the thing we care about is going to be the rank of this matrix. And why do we care about that? So it turns out the rank of this matrix first is upper bounded by the size of S, which means if I find a lower bound for a rank of this matrix, I actually get a Kakea set bound, lower bound. And turns out you are also not losing much information by cons considering this object because its rank is uh, lower bounded by the size of the Kakea set divided by the size of the ring, so capital N. Um, and oh, let me just say that it's a zero one matrix, so you just consider the rank over any field and this claim holds over any field, so. And we, we which, we, which yeah, it, it, it will feature like over a few times in the talk. Like the, uh, we'll use this fact over different fields. Okay, so let's see why this is true. So the upper bound is very easy. Uh, each uh, row is the indicator vector of a line in the set. 
So if you think all the, of the non-zero columns in this matrix, they all have to correspond to points in the set. So this matrix has no more non-zero columns than the points in the set. So this upper bound is trivial. Okay. Now, why does the lower bound work? So the idea will be to iteratively pick lines in my set. Uh, and whenever I pick a new line, I make sure that it's, it has a point which is not covered by one of the lines I picked before. Uh, I can do this at least uh, the size of the set by n times because each line will throw away at most uh, n points. And the way you did this, because you always have a point which is not covered by uh, lines earlier, you have an upper triangular structure which will ensure that the indicator vector of these lines is linearly independent. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. Okay, nice. Okay, so our job will be to lower bound the rank of this matrix and the strategy is the following. Uh, we are going to give, we will, are going to find matrices A such that MS times A gives us a matrix which is independent of the set S. Okay, and the hope will be uh, that this matrix B has rank which we can calculate or someone already has calculated and then we'll be golden. All right. So now it turns out this matrix WPN works uh, if you set A as that. So, um, it's a reminder. Uh, this is A or this is B? So it will be both A and B. <laughs> yeah. B will be a site modification, but yeah, basically that. Um, so, okay. So the claim that we'll be proving is the following. Uh, so a row of this uh, matrix MS is the indicator vector of a line. So what you'll want to show is that the indicator vector of a line in direction U if you multiply this with the matrix W, then you get the indicator vector of the complement of a hyperplane with normal U. So the set of all points which have non-zero inner product with U. Okay. So uh, right. Just as a reminder, a WPN uh, matrix was the matrix which had its rows and columns as indicator vector of hyperplanes. Here we'll use the fact that the VH column of this matrix. Is the indicator vector of the hyperplane with normal V. So if you want to calculate this product, we just need to find figure out what this indicator vector times this indicator vector is. Okay. And because these are just simple zero one vectors, this is precisely just going to be the number of points in the intersection. All right. Uh, now three cases are possible. Either my line is completely contained, uh, is not completely contained in the hyperplane, so you have no point of intersection or it's completely contained in the hyperplane, so you have P points of intersection, or there is a precisely just one point of intersection, so you get one here. Now, right, uh, we are working over the field FP, so these two numbers are basically zero. And if you think about this, uh, the case of no intersection or complete containment is only possible when the line is parallel to my hyperplane, or namely, the direction U is normal uh, to the direction V. So you basically get this thing is zero if you be in a product is zero and one otherwise. So we have we have a claim. Okay, and you can uh, already see that the line could be an arbitrary line in direction u, but this output does not depend on which which line it is. It just depends on the direction. So basically, this tells us that if you multiply the matrix of lines with WPN, you get a matrix whose rows are indicator vector of these complement hyperplanes. And to represent a complement, we can just write it as the all ones matrix minus the matrix with uh, indicator vector, which are just the hyperplanes on the complement. Okay. And it turns out that the rank of WPN is known exactly. So, okay. So, uh, a bunch of people gave like different proofs for this. And we know that the rank of this matrix is P plus N minus two, choose N minus one and minus one. All right. And that basically tells us that the rank of this matrix is at least this quantity minus one. So uh, that also gives us a lower bound of the Kakya set. So we get this lower bound and this is at least P raised to N minus one by N factorial. Okay. So one thing to notice is that earlier we had something which was P raised to N, not N minus one. We seem to have lost something here. Uh, I'll say, like, I'll talk about shortly, like how to get rid of this. So this seems like a very new proof to be fair. Why is the new in quotes then? So let's talk about that. Um, 
So to talk about that, we need to define a new matrix, which we call eval PN. Okay, this will be a matrix whose columns are labeled by monomials of degree P minus one, and whose rows are labeled by points in FP to the N. And the XM entry is just the evaluation of this monomial on X. Okay, so the mth column is just the evaluation of that monomial on all points, all right. So it turns out the same strategy works with A substituted for eval, well, WP and substituted for eval. So what you're able to show is that the indicator vector of a line times eval is the UH row of eval times minus one. So the UH row of eval would be the evaluation of all monomials of degree P minus one at the point U. So this thing again does not depend on what precise line you take, only depends on the direction. Okay. So, so I'm not proving this, but this is a, you, you can uh, do this as like an exercise. It's not that hard. Um, okay. So this thing will now say the matrix of lines times eval is just the negative of eval because each of the direction will just give you each of the rows here. Okay. So it turns out eval also has a high rank. It also turns out that eval is actually the matrix W P comma N after base change. The way to see this is the indicator vector of a hyperplane is just the equation of the hyperplane raised to P minus one, which is a P minus one degree polynomial. And if you just take the linear combination of these things, you can basically generate all monomials of degree P minus one. Okay. So the indicator vector of a hyperplane is the linear equation of the hyperplane raised to P minus one, because it will make it zero one, like a number in FP raised to P minus one. Yeah. Now, this is a degree P minus one polynomial. And if you just take the linear combination of these things, you can generate every P minus one monomial. Okay. Or Warren's there. Right? Yeah, that's Warren's uh, theorem. Basically, it's an exchange of, uh, you know, monomial representation of polynomial and evaluation representation. Right. Just a random one there. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's so, let's change of basis. Yeah, yeah so it's, we are basically still looking at the same matrix. Um, and, okay. The way to connect this with the polynomial method proof is to, okay, so you can get a rank bond using the D Miller Lipton Schwartz simple lemma. And the, the way this works is the following. So if you take a linear combination of a columns in this matrix, that's basically looking at some polynomial of degree P minus one evaluated over all points. So if you went, if you say that, okay, this linear combination is zero, that basically means you're, you're wanting a degree P minus one polynomial to vanish over all points. So the same type of argument will give you a rank bond here. And that's also why this argument is just the polynomial method proof. Um, because what MS is basically doing, it's looking at the evaluation of, poly of a polynomial of degree P minus one. And by uh, looking at its evaluation along the lines, it's able to evaluate it on the direction U, right? Um, so uh, in the polynomial method proof, you had lower degree polynomials as well, but if you just did it over a homo homogeneous polynomial of degree P minus one, then the proof will look exactly the same. So. Um, and basically to get rid of that P minus one, you need to add more rows to the matrix MS so that they can decode lower degree uh, polynomials as well. And if you want to improve, go to the two raised to N minus one case, then you need to add rows to MS, which can decode not only things from evaluations, but also use derivatives of these polynomials somehow. And that will give you like better constants. Okay. So- But the, even if it's the same proof, it's a very nice <laughs> yeah. way to present the proof. No, and, and this presentation is also what gave us the ideas to solve other problems. So yeah, this, that's why I'm presenting this. Okay. So, okay. So let's actually prove the uh, square free case. So I'll just do it for two different prime factors. So now we need to do a lot of Chinese remainder theorem. So let's think about those things first. So uh, by Chinese remainder theorem, we know that Z mod PQ is precisely FP times FQ. So we can do this over a vector space or like whatever dimension in space as well. Uh, so to be precise, any element in Z mod PQ can be written as a tuple UP comma UQ in FP times FQ. And UP is just U mod P and UQ is U mod Q, okay? So now we can do the same thing for lines in direction U. So if you have a line in direction U, then uh, you can write it as a product of lines, one line in FP and one line in FQ. And the direction of these lines is going to be uh, UP, sorry, UP for the LP line and UQ for the LQ line respectively. So yeah, uh, 
like i hope like this line bit is clear because like the argument hinges on this now if you now look at the indicator vector of this line l you can now write it as the tensor product of the indicator vector of the line lp and lq so lp will be a line with columns in fp lq will be a line in columns in fq and if you do the kronecker or tensor product then you will precisely get the product of lines indicator vectors so that's why this identity works okay and as i had mentioned before by the chinese remainder theorem logic if you take kakya set sp uh in fp to the n and a kakya set sq in fq to the n and take the product then you will just get a kakya set in z mod pq okay and if all kakya sets were like this then it would be easy you just multiply the lower bound and you are done uh, because it has this nice product structure that is not true and that's why we have to do some work okay all right so okay so i will present like a simplified version of our proof uh to show that any kakya set s in z mod pq to the little n has size uh, p raised to n minus 1 times q raised to n minus 1 times a constant which only depends on n okay um all right so and i mean the basic idea to like go from a single prime factor to multiple prime factors is all in this proof but you have to get rid of this minus 1 and to improve this constant you just have to throw some tricks and derivatives and what not but we'll just look at this thing yeah okay so again uh, what we'll work with is the line matrix of our kakya set so we'll just take a kakya set which only has lines no extra points and we had seen this product uh, structure now if you take the line matrix we can now write its uth row as this tensor product of two different lines and again to stress this line lp and lq can dip, can and will depend on both up and uq because if it because if lp only depended on depended on up and lq only depended on uq then you would exactly have that product structure that this kakya set is just the product of two kakya sets it's because there is this cross connection that you actually have to like there needs to be an argument okay so now we'll apply our strange strategy again we'll try to multiply this with the matrix to simplify it now the matrix you multiply it with is wpn tensored with just the identity matrix over the fq part so um, identity matrix of size q to the n times q to the n and we are doing this over the field fp so right now we are working over that now because of the tensor product structure the fp part only multiplies with the fp part the fq part only multiplies with the fq part but this is just identity so nothing happens here okay now this is very nice because we just saw that this product uh will give you the complement vector of a hyperplane with normal u p uh and now that basically gives you a matrix where this part only depends on up you have got you, you are able to like erase the uq dependence so that's very nice um now what we will do is we'll collect all these up vector uh, sorry we for a fixed up we'll collect all these lq vectors together so look at a fixed up Look at all indicator vectors where U P is fixed and U Q varies uh, for L Q. And if you look at this, then this will precisely be the line matrix of a Kakya set, which uh, is composed of these lines L Q with U P fixed and U Q is varying over all possible values. Okay. So now I can write the if I group my rows accordingly, I can write this as this fixed hyperplane complement hyperplane vector tensored with the uh line matrix of some kakya set in fq which does depend on up but it's the line matrix of a kakya set in fq okay now we also saw that that you know um the matrix of these complement hups has a high rank so many of these rows are linearly independent from each other so uh take uh so basically you saw that p raised to n minus 1 by n factorial many of these will be linearly independent of each other so uh take those rows and uh base change them to make them standard basis vectors so we just say take these take p raised to n minus 1 by n factorial rows corresponding to these many values of up and we uh base change so that these become standard basis vectors so now you just get a block diagonal matrix um uh, you each of these different values is its own block and if you want to find a rank lower bound we just need to 
rank lower bound each of these is different p raised to n minus 1 by n factorial block diagonal matrix okay but here is where our earlier matrix rank claim comes to the rescue the 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 field is not the same uh, until now you are working over fp yeah so now you have on msq is uh, over fq oh, was over any field because uh, it's it's a zero, zero. Yeah. yeah good yeah. Yeah. so exactly so we had a lower bound for the rank of msq which was the size of the set by q but that was over any field so namely it works over the field fp as well and we already know lower bounds for the size of sq uh, namely q raised to n by 2 raised to n minus 1 so this is q raised to n minus 1 by 2 raised to n minus 1 right and if you just put these things together put these things together you get p raised to n minus 1 times q raised to n minus 1 you get n factorial from here 2 raised to n minus 1 from induction so this induction is in quotes because in general you will do this inductively and at this stage you will just apply the inductive argument to use the kakia bound for one less prime factor Okay, uh, we are used just using the base case here, so not really induction. All right, so now we are now we are done. And as I said, to improve these constants and get rid of this, you need to use derivatives, and you there is like one trick in the world to get rid of this minus one as well. So the key thing is really uh, remove the dependence of the other coordinates yes. by one. So, uh, yeah, by by this multiplication, by Indeed. not always gives you yeah, something independent of S at least in the mm -hmm. first prime of this. Yeah. Okay, um, nice. Okay, so I do have 10 minutes, and so this will be like, yeah. Maybe any questions? Right. So yeah. I mean, I would really like that everyone understands like the first three parts because the ideas there are simple. Four will be like a dramatic gear change. So um, if anyone has questions, I'm like happy to go over them. So I presume people got something out of the stuff so far. So let's look at the proof for prime powers. Okay. So, um, okay, maybe uh, let me just say that the idea is to do some polynomial method uh, type argument. But as we saw over Z mod P to the K, polynomials are really bad. But one place polynomials are not bad are over like complex numbers, over characteristic zero. And we'll first figure out a way to put Z mod P to the K in complex numbers and then try to do polynomial method over complex numbers okay so the way we will do this is uh, by taking zeta which is a complex primitive p raised to kth root of unity so it's basically a p raised to kth root of unity primitive just means that it's actually a p raised to kth root it's not a p raised to k minus one root in disguise uh, and the ring we'll work with will be the ring uh, z zeta where which is basically the ring generated by the integers and uh, zeta okay now the way we put Z mod P to the K here is by mapping this point X to Zeta raised to X. And because Zeta is a primitive P raised to K through, this is a bijection. So like uh, commutative properties are not being lost here. Okay, nice. Um, and now we can hope to do some polynomial method. Um, and the way we'll do this is by again, looking at some new eval matrix. I'll just call this E here, now P to the K, K, K comma N. Its columns are going to be labeled by monomials MV. Uh, rows by points uh, in the space X. And uh, the M X comma MVH point is going to be the evaluation of MV on zeta raised to X. So these are monomials in characteristic zero. So when you multiply these uh, S to the X1, X to the, I mean, the monomial multiplies them, right? I mean, the mon monomial multiplies entries of these sets to the X. Yeah. So it, it adds them in the exponents. Yes. So, right, uh, so what Avi is basically saying, if you just were to compute this, this will be precisely zeta raised to the inner product of x and uh, v. We'll see that shortly as well if that doesn't make sense right now. Okay, and again, uh, basically the uh, column here is just the evaluation of this monomial over every point in this embedding. And let me say that earlier we were just looking at degree p minus one monomials. Now we look at all monomials with where each individual degree is up to p raised to k minus one. So these are like a lot more monomials uh, present in these, this argument, okay? So the initial idea is the same as before. We will try, so MS was our decoder matrix earlier. We'll try to find a new decoder matrix whose support is S. So basically it has all columns outside of S are zero. So it will have rank upper bounded by the size of S. 
and we'll want to say that okay, CS times this eval matrix gives us a matrix B, which is independent of S. And then we want to do the same thing, we we'll figure out its rank uh, and so on. Okay, so it turns out this hope is a bit too naive. This does not ha happen. Um, what we have to do is apply, there's some dangling terms and we have to apply a mod P operation to get rid of them. So I'm calling it mod P because over the integers, it will exactly send Z to uh, Z mod P. But uh, it was, this will act in such a way that zeta is mapped to one. I'll talk about that uh, soon. And it will turn out that our decoder matrix will be such that CS times uh, uh, the survival matrix mod P is precisely going to be our mysterious matrix B. So originally, Zev and I had shown that you could do, do this and get W, so WP to the K comma N, but we couldn't figure out how to do it, uh, like figure out a rank lower bound for W. So uh, our subski is able to give a new, uh, I guess a better decoder to give a new matrix V, which has W as a sub matrix. Anyway, so another thing to notice that earlier I was just multiplying C, S, and E and saying that, okay, the a rank lower bound of this product gives us a rank lower bound of C, S, but now I have this weird mod P operation in, in between. So turns out this, this mod P operation will not increase rank. So everything is uh, good in this uh, framework. Okay. So let me first Does talk about increase rank over what field. Oh, so, okay. So this will uh, send things to FP. So I guess the FP rank here will be a lower bound for like the characteristic zero rank of this matrix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, now, this matrix V is going to be actually a matrix of polynomial entries. So um, I'll have to like define two new rings which we'll work over. Uh, so let's so just, like a yeah. just answer me, but I'm not sure I understood yeah. the answer. Uh, also, after you reduce mod P, mm -hmm. there are complex entries in this matrix. So, it, by... so it turns out that mod P thing sends all zetas to one. So the, the, all of those numbers ah, become one. All zetas to one. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's in code and I do not simply write smart C. Yeah. yeah. So now the rings we'll work over is the following TK and T bar K. TK is just Z with Zeta appended with this extra variable little z. And little z satisfies the relations uh, Z raised to PK minus one. And T bar K is just Z Zeta replaced with FP. And it satisfies the relation Z raised to PK minus one. As I mentioned, the mod P operation will. This sub K is really what you were working on. I'm sorry? T sub K is isomorphic. Is T sub K isomorphic? Also, you have polynomials in Z of zeta with an X of R. Yeah, the next is polynomials instead of numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our, our entries will actually have Z in them. Yeah. But this satisfies the same uh, polynomial equation that zeta does. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Oh, you mean like this, this relation? Yeah. Zeta is such a cyclotomic polynomial, so it's somehow like, but yeah, in some sense. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay, the mod P mod operation I mentioned sends Z to FP and Zeta becomes one. So basically TK mod P is precisely T bar K. And okay, so, and over little Z does nothing, it just maps little Z to Z little Z. So our mod P map is basically the map which maps Zeta to one, Z to FP via the regular mod P map, and little Z is untouched. It turns out this thing is precisely going to be a ring homomorphism. So it will respect addition and multiplication. Okay, so let me, I will not prove this exactly, but let me basically give you the, an idea of why Zeta becomes one. So, okay. So Zeta we know is going to be the root of a of the P raised to K cyclotomic polynomial. So we know it's a P raised to K root of unity, so it satisfies this. We also know it's not a P raised to K minus one root of unity, so I can get rid of you can get rid of all of them here. So I can divide by this. Um, and it's basically the minimal polynomial of Zeta. So it satisfies this. The thing to notice is that over FP, uh, the root of this polynomial is precisely one. So uh, phi of one is zero mod P. Um, I mean, there's several ways to look at this. You can just look at this expression or if you just are familiar with fields, you can just simply look at this. So basically it turns out that phi in over characteristic zero had roots, the primitive p raised to kth roots. But when I go to sp, suddenly all of my roots become one. So precisely this mod p operation uh, 
sends all my primitive three periods to k s roots to one. Okay, so you you can like write it down precisely doing quotients and stuff, but I don't want to do that here. But you can ask me later if you would like. Okay, so another reason to call this mod p is that if you are familiar with what like with PRX, then in some very precise sense, if you write the PRX expansion of zeta, mod p is literally getting rid of like the p part in that expansion. It, it, it's fine if you don't get it. Um, hopefully, this gives you enough of an idea of what's happening. Like the, this, the minimal polynomial of zeta just becomes a polynomial with only one as a root data when you go mod p. Okay, so we'll be working over these rings, and let me finally define what the matrix V is. So V is going to be a matrix with entries which are going to be polynomials in Z, and the uvth entry is going to be little z raised to the inner product of, of um, I mean, I'm out of time. Is it fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little z is going to be raised to the power, raised to the inner product of u and v, and where u, v are going to be entries in z mod p to the k. Okay, so this is a matrix of polynomial entries, and uh, so, so just uh, to understand, this could have been defined from the beginning. Uh, without the zeta. Yes. You could have gone to the this polynomial ring without all this explanation. Okay, you mean explanation. defining this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out like starting from the decoder and going from eval to this, yeah, basically needs zeta because zeta is where like z mod p to the k is actually living. Uh, like zeta is to. Yeah, but I mean, the k still exists in this definition. That's true. Um, I guess I understand that that's how you got to it. So, what's his name? Alsovsky got mm -hmm. to, uh, whoever got into this definition. But could we have skipped completely the zeta part and the complex part? So, I'll say this this ring is not a field. When we have zeta, it's a field. Polynomials are nice, you can understand them. So, I think that's like the main thing that you are working in characteristic zero, it's actually a field. So, you can, you, so you, you, you can use properties of polynomials. Here, I don't know if all of those things will happen. You didn't show us where you use the field proper. Yeah, I mean, I'll show you. Yeah. I, I, I'll give the proof. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you need that in the decoder matrix. You, can, you can't uh, get to this matrix without that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and the decoder, I mean, I guess, are we saying that could you directly decode just like working over this Z, Z thing? Yeah, over FP, but not in prime power, right? Uh, I mean, I guess it's not a priori clear. That's also, in the final proof, it's not the same k. It's z, the, the z to the p to the k, it's a different. Case. That's also true. Maybe I'll ask again after we see. Yeah. So, I, I guess I did not mention this at all, but well, maybe I'll say that. Uh, maybe I sh should say that. Uh, here it seems that, okay, this little k and this k are the same. But to get like improved constants, the one which I had shown earlier, this k, little k, will be bigger than. The K there. Even for this constant, yeah. I'm happy with uh, without the. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll see. So, okay, so that's uh, the thing we need to know about this is that this matrix has FP rank at least P by K plus N minus one choose N. This is precise without the constant, I mean, take, take the Ks. No, it's at least, yeah, it's not precise. I mean, yeah. No, if you get K equal one and N equal one, yeah. then it looks like the Chabotard theorem mod P. And uh, over the complex number, I know that this is rank P. The complex number, this is F. Over the mode P, I don't think it is rank P. Oh. Um, I see. Mm. I, mean, the, the, I mean, like, are you really claiming this or up to, or like, uh, up to some constant multiple? It's not uh, the Chabotard theorem. You have a variable there, so it's not right. Maybe it's the same, but no, no, but take k equal one and n equal one. Yeah, but the, the entries are, are uh, polynomials, are the, the variable is opposed to constant polynomials. I'm not sure it matters, but so uh, I mean, uh, are you saying that if, if instead of uh, z you had like this kind of inner product matrix with n equal to one, then it, it will not be p there? No, it, it's not if you take n equal one and k equal one, yeah, but uh. This uh, I'm not familiar with this theorem, but uh, is that theorem about like the matrix W instead of like V? The theorem is uh, is uh, that the uh, you know Fourier transform matrix over the field yeah. is completely full of length over the complex number. I see, I see. So uh, that's why you, you can look at this the same matrix mod P and it does not have full. 
But it's not. Look at that. Yeah, look at that zeta. It's a z. Z is a thing. It's a variable. It's a variable. So one thing to notice is that this is right now. It's not a matrix over a field. So if you want to do that, each z will be will be a whole column by itself because the coefficients of z will give you different rows. So your matrix is in fact like larger in some sense. Okay. So I mean, maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so it turns out this matrix has FP rank at least this. Now, this is not a matrix with field entry, so what do I mean by FP rank? Um, so FP rank here is just the largest number of linearly independent columns, okay? And, okay, in the very beginning, I had shown a slightly different looking thing. So, Skarsky's original paper, um, there is an analysis which gives us a slightly weaker bound, but that same argument, if you just tighten constants a bit, will give you this bound. Okay, um, all right. Now, I will not talk about the proof here, but let me just give you a taste. So, uh, this matrix V is quite literally the Vandermond matrix in this variable Z. So, this turns out this thing has a very, very explicit LU decomposition. L is lower triangular, U is upper triangular, has a very explicit formula. So, all you need to do is just figure out the number of non zero entries in U to lower bound this rank. I will not do that here, but it's yeah, let's uh, talk about like the decoding argument now. Okay, so uh, so how do we do the decoding? So uh, the idea is that for any polynomial with uh, integer coefficients, what we are going to do is uh, we look at the evaluation of that polynomial over zeta raised to LU. So you have a line in direction U and you evaluate your polynomial over all of those points. And um, a linear combination of those evaluations after applying the mod P map will give you F evaluated on little z raised to U. So if you want to compare this to the fine field case, there by looking at evaluations along a line, you could, uh, if the degree was low enough, you could decode uh, the polynomial and get the evaluation of the highest degree part of that polynomial on the direction. So um, something which does not depend on the precise line, just on the direction. Here you have something similar. You take a polynomial with integer coefficients, you only look at its evaluations along a line. And after doing some decoding and applying the smart P map, you get something which only depends on the direction. There is no uh, dependence on the actual line left. So the precise Statement is you have your line in direction u, you have some constants uh, over this ring um, for each of the points on the line, such that if you take the linear combination of the evaluation of this polynomial with these coefficients and you apply your mod p map, you spit out f uh, evaluated on z raised to little u. Okay, so uh, hopefully your statement makes some sense. Now, to be able to apply the mod p map, Notice that we are doing something where um, the coefficients could be rational, so divisions by p could be happening. But it will turn out that if, uh, the output of this uh, will be a polynomial in z with coefficients in z mod zeta. So it's fine to apply the mod p map. Okay, um, and this expression is linear over z. So it suffices to prove this just for monomials, um, which is what we are going to do. Okay, so let's look at the proof. So let's look take a monomial uh, with degrees v1 to vn. Okay, so let me first prove the statement uh, for a line passing through the origin. Okay, so things will be easier there. So let's look at the evaluations of this monomial on a line passing through the origin. So it has direction u, so you have points zeta raised to zero, zeta raised to u, u square, uh, lambda u, and so on. So you're doing these evaluations. And as Avi said, evaluating this at zeta raised to u is precisely calculating zeta raised to the inner product of v and u, right? Or in other words, you could look at a one variable monomial little z raised to inner product of u and v, and evaluate it on one, zeta, zeta square, zeta raised to p minus, p raised to k minus one, okay? So, okay, so let's just focus on this. You have a single uh, variable polynomial. You have its evaluations over these p raised to k points. Now, 
Uh, that can be thought of as a map from the ring of one variable polynomials to this ring. So basically, this ring takes my one variable polynomial and finds its, finds its remainder after division by z minus one. That's evaluation at one. And you do it for each of these numbers. So precisely, this is going to give us a ring map from a one variable polynomial to its evaluations over these p raised to k points. OK? Now, um, there is a Chinese remainder theorem in this setting as well. So it turns out this ring is isomorphic to this other ring, where instead of independently dividing it with each of these factors, you can just look at its remainder after dividing by the whole polynomial, so the product of all these numbers. Okay. But this is a polynomial factors one, zeta, zeta square, zeta raised to pk minus one, which are basically all the p raised to kth roots of unity, uh, even like the non primitive ones. Now, just to make sure, the number of products in the denominator is the p to the k. Yes. So this product is going to be exactly z to the pk minus one. Okay. So that means there is some map which starts from these evaluations and spits out a polynomial or like an element of this ring. So to be precise, there ex exist constants in this ring, which will, uh, if you take the linear combination with these constants, that should spit out exactly z raised to uv uh, in the ring where you are quotienting by z to the pk minus one, okay? But now we seem to have proven our theorem without applying the mod p map. We are actually just over tk, not t bar k. And okay, so our coefficients could be rational, but we see that our output has integer coefficients. So things are fine. Okay, so where does the need for mod p come out? That actually happens because, uh, okay, that actually happens when we consider lines which are not passing through the origin. So let's see what, what happens there. Let's say my line actually does not pass through the origin, it's translated by this little a. Then it's not hard to see that this evaluation is just shifted. So you get, you can get, Zeta raised to the inner product of V and A out. Okay. So now we can now apply the same argument. The same decoding will just give you this Zeta term hanging and Z, Z, Z raised to UV. But our mod P map gets rid of Zeta. It makes Zeta one. Okay. So if now apply, we apply the mod P map, we get rid of this Zeta. It becomes one. But now instead of over, uh, over instead of being over TK, we are over T, T, T bar K. So we actually now are. Uh, in characteristic p instead of characteristic zero. So let me also say that like the same argument, uh, it's very nice because you can re repeat the same argument for when you just have evaluation at just fewer points, not at every uh, point. And you can also extend it when you have derivatives and not just evaluations, which is what we need to get like stronger bonds and, and epsilon bonds. So the way we use this lemma is to construct a decoder matrix. So for a given li uh, line u, we can find a decoding row Cu such that Cu times Ep to the k. Uh, oh, okay, there needs to be a psi here, which I forgot, sorry. So there is a mod p map here. So mod p times this matrix is going to be precisely z raised to Vu, which is the ueth row of our matrix V. So we, we, are, we have a decoding matrix Cu, uh, or a decoding row Cu which can, uh, which depends on the line, but spits out some value, which only depends on the direction. And as we saw, CU only looks at the evaluations on the line. So this has support LU. So, okay. So basically Arsovsky gave this decoding row, but his uh, argument was a very explicit description of what CU is. So he actually wrote down values for CU and showed that it works. Okay. But what I just showed you is uh, the argument from uh, this, uh, my new paper. So, which is nice because this argument, which is, well, maybe it doesn't actually tell you what CU is, works for uh, the setting where you have fewer points and derivatives, which is what allows us to get better constants. Um, I like better constants in the M epsilon case as well. Okay. So now our final decoding matrix C is basically this matrix with row CU for each line LU. And okay, there was a mod P here. So you now can implement the whole argument. That's like the entirety of the thing. Hopefully that made sense, but if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Questions? This new paper online? Yeah, it's uh, 10 days ago. Yeah. What's the title? Oh, so, uh, chaos set conjecture for general learning. Yeah, I think the same as the presentation, yeah. Oh.
where is Alsovsky? I'm sorry. <laughs> where, where does this person Alsovsky is? is Alsovsky in Europe. Yeah, he's in he's a number series in like England. I can't remember. I think Sheffield. I'm not sure. Yeah. I must ask because I, I have a, a, a meeting with somebody, but I just want to say, let me I, uh, tell you to look at the paper I wrote with Shai Van Kovalski mm -hmm. because these type of things have some connection with cyclic codes. Okay. And, um, and maybe in the in the in the wrong direction, <laughs> namely. Maybe it's known there is an, a long standing problem if there are a, a good cyclic codes. And we believe that there are if the length is prime. Now, there are proofs uh, uh, that there are not if the length is p to the something. I see. And maybe your results. I mean, I, I'm afraid that your results will will be against us, but but it's this is the truth. This is the truth. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I was trying to think uh, simultaneously on your yeah. problem and on my problem. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, so certainly you can we can talk about that. So yeah. So it's it's uh, Shayevra and and uh, me and uh, Kowalski. We wrote an expositive paper. We, we couldn't prove anything, but we have some kind of. Uh, Related to, to uncertainty principle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the results of Roy Meshulam and mm -hmm. the Tau. Okay, I know the must rush. Okay. Nice to talk. Thank you. Thank you. One question. Uh, maybe I should just say something. So, uh, check it back out. <laughs> So, okay, whatever we saw so far, um, that's enough to like get uh, bounds for like general line for the Kakya setting. But yeah, you might have noticed that in the, the MX1 setting, things are trickier. So, I guess when general line, even with like this MX1 thing, when you don't have full lines, I guess that's still open. I have like some ideas there, but yeah, it's, some are arguments, some are really depends that the whole line is there. That's why you have this product structure. So that's like something to keep in mind. Okay, thanks.